this is my methods to study um, hemoglobinopathies, what we do in the laboratory. So from this, so hopefully you'll be able to get the principles of the methods that we're going to be using to diagnose different variants, different presentations, some of these variants that we see, um, molecular abnormalities that we may see, and the implications of having a hemoglobin variant. Obviously, hemoglobin is actually a molecule. Um, most of its protein of the erythrocytes. Um, most people understand what hemoglobin looks like. We have normal hemoglobin composition. So we've got adult, we've got hemoglobin A2, hemoglobin A and hemoglobin F. Most of most hemoglobin is 98% A, 3%, 2 to 3% A2, up to 2% F we classify as normal. We have different types of variants and their presence can lead to sickling, thalassemia syndrome, lifelong cyanosis, hemolytic anemia or erythrocytosis, or if there's a heterozygous is of sufficient prevalence, we may warrant genetic counselling. There are different types of variants we see. Uh, the majority of them are single amino acid replacements. We also get structural alterations, and these can be explained by a single base substitution in the corresponding triplet codon of the globin gene DNA. Others can just be fusions. Others can be deletions. More than one, we can get more than one point mutation in the same polypeptide chain. So the changes that we see may affect the hemoglobin, its behaviour, its production rate, or its stability. There are several hundred hemoglobin variants that have been documented. Only a few are common or are clinically significant. How do we find these out? Some patients come in, they present with this. They present with the anemia or the erythrocytosis. They have cyanosis or they've got hemolysis. Some patients we see what, what, pick these up by preoperative sickling screens. Um, we pick up a lot through antenatal hemoglobinopathy screening as we're a high prevalence area here in London, so we screen everybody regardless. Some are get detected through the neonatal screening from the blood swap cards. Uh, some things we see, we pick up things with the full blood count, with the red cell, blood, red cell indices, or we can see from the morphology. Um, hemoglobin A1C measurements can detect hemoglobin variants because you sometimes don't detect hemoglobin A. Others can present as de novo mutations. These are the common variants that we see. So we see S's, E's, C's, deep and jobs, D-Rons, all the way through to some alpha and beta thalassemias. So clinically significant hemoglobin variants. So we look at the sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, the sickling syndrome. So SS. SC, SD, Punjab, SO Arab, and the S beta thals. We also look for unstable hemoglobins, ones that have altered oxygen affinity, the M hemoglobins. We also look for things with structural variants voting in thalassemic phenotypes. So we look at hemoglobin lipase, which is a, a delta beta fusion, or we look at ones with abnormal mRNA processing, so like hemoglobin E and hemoglobin kenosis. So other ones have extreme instability, like hemoglobin Indianapolis. Other ones, we look at thalassemic phenotypes, so we can look at chain termination mutations, which is constant spring, or the extremes instability, hemoglobin quonsae. When we look at inheritance of hemoglobinopathies, we have to have parents with the actual disease. So one parent with one, one parent another, you've got a one in four chance of having a pet child with SS. And the same over here, we can have an S beta, mum and dad, SS, S and beta. Children may be affected or not affected at all. What do we do from the laboratory side? So we look for a full blood count, for ticks and a blood film, because a blood film can tell you an awful lot. We do a sickle solubility or a sickling test. We can look for HPLC, capillary electrophoresis. We can do cellulose acetate membrane, agar gel and isoelectric focusing. But unstable haemoglobins, we look at heat instability and isopropyl precipitation. We can also look for inclusions and high body formations. We can also look at mass spectrometry and DNA analysis. What do we see from the full blood count, in particular the red cell indices? Are they low or are they high? Look for the red cells, are they low or are they high? Patient iron deficient or are they thalassemic or did they have erythrocytosis? So the full blood count can tell you an awful lot on a patient. So lipocytosis, hyperchromasia, and we look for variation in red cell size. This is what a normal blood film looks like, nice normal red cells, normal white cells. So look at the morphology, microcytic, hyperchromic. Do we have sickle cells? Do we have target cells? Do we have irregular contractor cells? 
Or do we have Basil Phillips sibling? Amanda, I think you've gone on to mute. Very sorry. Sorry about that. I can hear someone in the background talking. Sorry. <coughs> I'll go back to this one. For beta thalassemia major, look at the blood film. We can see microcytic hyperchromic red cells with lots of NRBCs. When we look at sickle cell anemia, we can see obviously sickle cells, polychromasia, irregularly contracted cells. Hemoglobin C, many, many target cells within hemoglobin C. Sometimes we would see C crystals. When we look for hemoglobin Hammersmith, this is an unstable hemoglobin. We see polychromasia, tiny spherocytes. We'd also see, hemoglobin, we'd also see plenty of basophilic stippling within this film, indicating an unstable hemoglobin. When we look at different techniques that we can use to measure these, we can look at HPLC, high pressure liquid chromatography. This is the BioRed variant analyzer which used to do most of our work, have now changed over to a CBR analyzer. With this machine, it's got a principle of ion exchange HPLC. So the samples are therefore mixed when they go on the machine, on the variant, and it's injected into the analytical cartridge dual pumps, and that delivers to a program buffer gradient of increasing ionic strength to the cartridge. The hemoglobin A2 and F are separated based on the ionic strength for the cartridge, and the separated hemoglobin A2 and F are passed through the flow cell of the filter photometer, where changes in absorbance at 4115 are measured. An additional filter at 690 corrects the background absorbance and then, it then the CDM analyzes the data and forms the chromatograms. This is what the cartridge looks like, it's just the powder with inside. It's very tiny, the cartridge is only about, about an inch big. So when we look at the different levels, so sample loads, Illusion of weak hemoglobin. So we will see things like hemoglobin H disease, H coming off first, and the stronger ones on this system, we'll see the stronger ones that's charged at the other end, we see the C's coming off at the other end. So when we look at the normal HPLC for the blood sample, what we're looking at with this, we're looking at how much A is present. This has got 88% A, how much A2 is present, what is present else F. We'll look at the baseline here to make sure it's completely flat at the very beginning, make sure nothing is peaking off here. And then we'll come along, this is our A peak, this is our A2 peak, and there's no additional peaks at the other end. So that is a normal blood sample for HPLC. But we can get variants in the A window that we don't notice. So all these, Haro, Lezzes, Aradi, Canossus, Gnostic, San Diego, Heathrow and Colm, we can see these are beta chain variants. We can also get alpha chain variants, Chicago, Baldwick and Wembley. So this patient came in with an exceptionally high hemoglobin F level but is it F? So when we've looked at a different method of measuring F, this actually was hemoglobin Marcel. So we're getting a, now getting a variant in the gamma region, which is F. These various peaks shows different peaks within the HPLC. So we can see S coming off here at the very end. We have C, we have hemoglobin E, E runs within the A2 window as well. Hemoglobin Buffalo that comes off fast. Hemoglobin D, this one is D Punjab because hemoglobin D Iran will come off in the A2 window with hemoglobin E and hemoglobin O Arab. So we get hemoglobin, we get gamma variants, we get delta variants, but most of the variants we see are beta chain variants. This is a patient with sickle cell trait. What we're looking at here, okay, then we've got the A window of 54, 55.4% and we have the S window of 34. We have to make sure that the A is more than the S to call it a trait. We look here, this is our peak for our sickle cell trait. So this lady came in. This is what her HPLC ran like. So she's got A and she's got S. This is our sickle cell trait patient. Again, A has to be more than S. This person's never had a transfusion in their life. They had no sickle cells on their film. But the A was more than the S. But what we found on this lady was so she's got hemoglobin Lazarade that runs in with the A. So she's got hemoglobin Lazarade and S. 
causing this chain imbalance here. When we look at sickle cell anemia, we do not have any haemoglobin A present at all. We only have one SP present. Obviously, the blood film from sickle cell anemia will show our nice sickle cells. Then we move on to capillary electrophoresis, which tends to be our method of choice at the moment at, the, at Northwest Standard Pathology. It is very fast and it's very effective. So with our capillary electrophoresis, the substances are separated by electroosmotic flow to so the narrow bore capillaries. The electrophenogram pinks are very distinct. The electrophenograms are divided into 15 zones according to elution times. The most positively charged haemoglobin such as are in the hemoglo haemoglobin A are in zone one, whilst the most negatively charged haemoglobins are in zone 15. It can separate out haemoglobin A2 and E unlike HPLC, but that cannot give S level if there's no haemoglobin A present. It's fast, but some samples need to be rerun with controls added into them. This is what we would see from capillary electrophoresis. So we have an A peak here and we have the A2 peak here. And if we look at haemoglobin AS, so we get the S, and we get an A2 peak, so we can separate out S and A2 together. Most of our common haemoglobin variants we see is haemoglobin E, and it's the second most common haemoglobin variant in the world. And it's prevalent in Southeast Asia, especially Cambodia, Laos and Thailand, and individuals of Southeast Asian descent. Individuals with homozygous for haemoglobin E are symptomatic. Some have slightly normal or slightly decreased haemoglobin levels. Most of these red cells are hypocritic, but you have to rule out an EB to zero on these patients. Levels of, you get decreased levels of haemoglobin B to E, mRNA, so therefore you get impaired production with these people. This is a homozygous E blood film. As you can see, it's just mainly target cells within this film. But this is homozygous E versus haemoglobin E beta. So from the bio, by rad right? we cannot tell the distinctively because haemoglobin E and beta cell will run together. But haemoglobin E really matters because some dependent upon the um, beta mutation, some of these patients are uh, transfusion dependent for life. Other tests we can do, which are cheap and quick to do, are sickle solubility tests. So what we do with this, the erythrocytes are lively saponin and then they release, the release haemoglobin is deoxygenated by dithionite in a concentrated phosphate buffer. Haemoglobin S when deoxygenated is insoluble and produces visibility. We use this if haemoglobin has got to be above 20%. You can't use these in children with very high F levels because it interferes within the test. You can do a sickling prep using the same lower reagents and what you do, you will force sickling within, these pa within patients with haemoglobin S. Um, and you can look at this down the microscope to see. This is very good for people who have S levels less than 20%, especially babies. Another method we can use is cellulose acetate. A cellulose acetate is a manual method um, and it runs at pH 8.6 and you can separate the haemoglobin according to their amino acid side chains. So the more negative charge move towards the anode faster and it's good for separating of S, C, D, E and F and fast moving bands. What we can look at is mobilities of haemoglobin on the cellulose acetate membrane. So we have C and A2 will run together, S, F and A, K, Barts, J, N and H. H will run quite fast. So if you know someone with H when you're doing this, you have to watch the actual cam because they can run too fast. But also with these, we get C, O, E, A2, C, Harlem and an SG hybrid will fall in the C window and we get S, D and G and L, Lepore will fall here. So we can get, need to separate these out again. This is, a, this is what the cellulose acetate will look like. So we have the AFSC control, we have an AA2, an SS. You can see sometimes with the beta cells a higher level of A2 on these girls. Slight difference between those two. There's an AS and there's an AC. Then we go on to agar gel. So agar has various haemoglobin separate in order of their affinity for the agopeptin and they have endo Electroendomosis. Okay, so the agarpeptin is polysaccharides are found in the agar preparation and it consists of D-galactose linked. Some of the uh, galacto units are sulfated. So when you look at the separation of this, the osmosis is under the influence of electro electronic field in the electrophoresis. The hemoglobin C has the greatest affinity and it migrates towards the anode with the gel. 
Uh, different haemoglobins may have less interaction and migrate towards the cathode. Some haemoglobins, e.g. high oxygen affinity, separate from haemoglobin A at pH 6, but not at 8.6. When we look at this, we can now separate our S and our Ds and our Gs. We can now separate our Cs, which will run here, from our Es, which will run here. So it is another method of separating out haemoglobins if you do not have the automated methods. This is what an agar gel electrophoresis looks like. So we have the AC, we have an AD, AE, so the Ds and E will run together. Another AC there. We have an SS here and we have an FASC control. Different mobilities, variants of haemoglobins on the Kalman agar. So we look at the controls AFFC where they run together, different pHs, separate those out. We can separate out the D Irans and the D Punjabs. We can separate out the Q Indias. We can separate our CEs and Os from one method to another. Another method we can use is our called isoelectric focusing. So this technique will separate out the haemoglobin molecules on the basis of their molecular charge. The agrogel contains ampholytes which contain different isoelectric points. Um, and the ampholytes are molecules containing both acid and basic groups. These create a pH gradient after a high voltage electric current is applied. So negatively charged molecules <laughs> migrate towards the anode through the pH gradient. <coughs> Positively charged molecules more to move towards the cathode. And then they reach a pipe zone of an identical pH where then they're classified and then when they focus. So isoelectric focus in our separations of the haemoglobin variants with isoelectric points differing by little as 0.02 pH units. Um, it's a very specialised technique and not very many places do this technique. Um, you get various mobilities of various haemoglobins by isoelectric focusing. So you have a massive gel and you can look at very, very quite a lot at the same time. If you have known ones, you can run them against the haemoglobin that you are looking at. When we look at mass spec for another method of looking at abnormal haemoglobin, and it involves the techniques of bombardment of the molecule species under examination with electrons or other high energy particles. These cause the ionization and fragmentation of the molecule result in a wide spectrum of ionized particles which are separated by their mass to charge ratio. Um, this technique, I have no examples on unfortunately, but it's not a technique we do here, but other hospitals will may, may provide this technique. We can also look at DNA analysis and there's various methods of haemoglobin we can look at for DNA analysis and different methods. They can look at gap PCR, they can actually sequence the genome. If we move on to haemoglobin H disease, it's a tetramer composed of four normal beta chains. And it typically results in consequence of the loss of three alpha chains. Um, this migrates on cellulose acetate electrophoresis as a fast moving variant, also moves very fast on HPLC. It has a marked phenotype variability. There's a lot of variability within haemoglobin H disease ranging from asymptomatic to the need for periodic transfusion to severe anemia with hemolysis and hepatosplenomegaly, and even to fatal hydroxyphetalis syndrome in uterus. So when we look at haemoglobin H disease, it has a feature of typical chronic hemolytic anemia. Uh, a few individuals develop more severe problems, including transfusion dependency. Now, haemoglobin H can be acquired. It can be genetic. It also can be non-deletional. We look here. Is our haemoglobin H running fast on this one here. This is the morphology of somebody with haemoglobin H disease. We have marked microcytosis, um, irregularly contracted cells, very tiny cells, microcytic cells, hyperchromic cells. When we look at haemoglobin H disease, we can look at a H prep. This is quite a cheap test to look at and it's a super vital stain with new methylene blue. And what you do, you get excess of the beta chains will precipitate out and we see what we call golf balls. These can be seen on the peripheral blood. Hemoglobin BARTS is composed of four normal gamma globin chains. It migrates on cellulose acetate as a fast moving band. Uh, it may be seen on cool blood samples. Uh, so we may see it at different percentages, two to four percent if you've got one deletion, five to eight percent you have this deletion or 25 percent this deletion. So this is hemoglobin BARTS. It's an early eluting fraction here. 
However, hemoglobin H may result as a consequence of a loss of all four alpha chains. So therefore we have no normal alpha chains produced and it is classified as Bart's hydrox vitalis. This is a baby T. Um, this is a baby born with hydrox vitalis. We have no hemoglobin A, no hemoglobin A2, no hemoglobin F. Um, as you can see, the baby's got hepatosplenomegaly. Other haemoglobins we look at within the laboratory are unstable haemoglobins. Uh, there's substitutions that can alter the tertiary or core tertiary structure of the molecule. They have a charge difference. It's not external or it's neutral. So we don't tend to see separation of these. Sometimes we do with these people, but sometimes we don't on HPLC. There are very many different types of unstable haemoglobin. There's Bonacerios, Bristol, Casper, Shepherd's Bush, Hammersmith. It's about 250 of 800 known mutations of haemoglobins are found to be unstable and to a lesser or greater degree. And you get abnormalities in alpha, beta and gamma globin chains have also been described. So these patients may present with chronic non sphericitic hemolytic anemia, with splenomegaly, pigmented bilirubin, gallstones. They may have Heinz body hemolytic anemia with sensitivity to oxidant drugs such as sulfamides. They may have mild or minimal anemia with particular cytosis out of proportion to the level of circulating hemoglobin. Some may have thalassemic like peripheral blood pictures, some may have hyperchromic red cells, and then some may actually have the increased formation of met hemoglobin. So this is a Heinz body prep on somebody with an unstable hemoglobin. And what we can see here is the super vital staining of dark aggregates. These are called Heinz bodies. If you look on a normal peripheral blood film, you can see these. They will bud out from the edge of a normal red cell. We can have unstable GANA chain variants such as hemoglobin pool. These are associated with hemolysis in the first few months of life. But as your gamma chains will disappear, um, this mutation will disappear. But then on the other hand, children with unstable beta chain variants may appear normal at birth and then they progressively hemolysis appearing during the first year of life as the beta chain production increases. So this is an unstable hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin Southampton. <coughs> Here we can see irregularly contracted cells. Um, we have the basophilic stippling within this patient. So we've got bite cells and we've got NRBCs. We can detect unstable hemoglobins by doing a heat instability test. So when you place this in a solution of Tris HCl at pH 7.4 and then you heat it up for about three hours, the van der, Waals, van der Waals bonds are weakened and they separate out and we see precipitation. The issues with this test and the same with the isopropanol test, which is isopropanol again, we break down the van der Waals bonds. Um, we know that there's a variant present, but this method doesn't tell us what the variant actually is. Um, if samples got high F levels, they may give us false positive unless we have an aged match sample to run with it. Other haemoglobins are called the M haemoglobins. They're first described in 1948. These affected individuals had lavender blue appearance while their blood appeared brown. We can look at these for doing an absorption spectra because they absorb differently from that haemoglobins. Um, various types, M Saskatoon, Boston, High Park. <coughs> this baby was born and this baby has obviously cyanosis around the mouth. It's cyanosis is evident, hemoglobin M ice weight. So why do we need to do all this, looking for these abnormal haemoglobin? So we need to screen, so all our antenatal patients are screened. Is there any clinical relevance performing this? What technique are we going to choose depending on what haemoglobin we're looking at? Are we going to go straight for DNA or are we going to do CB? Are we going to do electrophoresis first? Or are we going to do a sickle solubility? Is it effective in the heterozygous form? Because some of these haemoglobins can affect the patients when they're heterozygous, as in haemoglobin Southampton. Do they affect in the homozygous forms? What type of treatment is needed for these patients going forward? Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Does anyone have any questions for Amanda?
Mando, I was going to ask, um, in terms of the screening programs for the, these various um, uh, uh, genetic differences, when um, new sort of genetic formations are, are discovered, how does that get added to the pre-existing screening programs? Is that um, something external bodies come along and talk to the lab teams about? Uh, is it something that you have to develop individual tests for? So you're saying about new, new types of variants? Yeah. Um, we tend to send our work off if we think we've got something new off for DNA analysis and they'll look at the gene database. Excellent. Um, does that does that occur on a frequent basis then? Uh, quite often. I mean, if we have something that we have, we can't identify, obviously we'll send it off for DNA analysis and they'll screen, they'll screen the whole gene. Um, and then they'll come back and they'll tell us if it's on the database or not, what effects it is. And um, sometimes I don't know if they, I don't know who adds them to the database, so. The new variants. Thanks. Does anyone have any other questions for Amanda? In that case, thank you so much, Amanda, for that excellent talk. Um, Julia, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready. Can you see my slides? Uh, yeah, I can see uh, one bigger one and then it has the kind of next slide uh, in a sort of smaller uh, pane. Yeah, let's see how I get rid of that. Just trying to work out no, how to do this. Try again. Yes. Perfect. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Perfect. <coughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll make a start then. So I'm going to go through some um, patient cases um, during the next 25 minutes. I've got nine in total um, and I've tried to include a few interesting and unusual cases and also some cases that um, highlight the potential pitfalls and diagnostic challenges um, in the diagnosis of haemoglobinopathies. Sorry. So, um, so case one is a 37 year old male of African origin who has undergone haemoglobinopathy screening um, as the partner of an antenatal patient. So the full blood count shows a normal haemoglobin, but thalassemic indices with a raised red cell count uh, and a low MCV and MCH. Now the HPLC on the left shows a haemoglobin F of uh, about 1.1%, haemoglobin A of 82%, uh, and A2 of 3.6%, which is just slightly elevated, uh, the upper limits of normal being about three. But there's also um, another peak in the S window measuring 3.4%. Now on capillary electrophoresis on the right, the haemoglobin A accounts for 93.1%, a haemoglobin F of 0.5% and an A2 of 3.5%. And as, as you can see, another peak <coughs> in the Z1 zone oh, yes. uh, of about 2.9%. Okay. So this actually shows a split haemoglobin A2 as a result of a uh, delta chain variant. So on the HPLC, um, the peak in the S window is in fact a variant A2, uh, and likewise on capillary electrophoresis, yeah. the peak in the Z1 zone is a variant A2. So the presence of an A2 unfortunately can mm. pose a diagnostic problem, that, sorry, an A2 variant can pose a diagnostic problem. Um, the diagnosis of beta thalassemia trait rests on the detection of an increased A2 and therefore the failure to detect a split A2 band can cause the diagnosis of beta thalassemia trait to be missed and as a result uh, of an incorrect estimation of the A2 percentage. 
So it's therefore important that haemoglobin variants yes. resulting from um, a variant delta chain or in fact a variant alpha chain are added to the normal A2 to determine whether the A2 is elevated. And in this particular patient, the haemoglobin A2 is around 7% and they in fact do have beta thalassemia trait in addition to a delta chain variant, which may be of significance depending on um, the status of the patient's partner. So case two is uh, an 18 year old male with a family history of what is described as an abnormal haemoglobin. The haemoglobin and hematocrit are slightly raised with a haemoglobin of 174 grams per litre and 0.5 uh, respectively. And on HPLC, there's a haemoglobin, um, there's haemoglobin A and a large peak in the A2 window measuring uh, about 44%, while on capillary electrophoresis on the right, uh, the variant in the A zone measures 96.8% um, with an A2 of 3.2%. And on further investigation into his family history, his mother was actually known to have a high affinity haemoglobin yes. known as well, haemoglobin uh, Bethesda, all, which was subsequently confirmed in this patient by DNA analysis. So haemoglobin Bethesda is a beta chain variant of high affinity uh, in which histidine is substituted for uh, tyrosine at position uh, for five. Now, the presence of a variant <coughs> haemoglobin with a high affinity usually leads to polycythemia. And so this diagnosis should be considered when there is an unexplained erythrocytosis, yeah, particularly yeah. in a young person or when a patient presents with a high haemoglobin and a family history of polycythemia. Yeah. And as you can see, the hematocrit and haemoglobin and the red cell count tend to be high uh, or towards the upper limit of normal, but the other um, red cell indices tend to be normal. Now, um, because haemoglobin Bethesda has an increased affinity for oxygen, this results in a leftward shift in the um, haemoglobin oxygen um, dissociation curve, uh, i.e. the haemoglobin binds <coughs> oxygen more easily, but unloads it more uh, reluctantly. Well, we'll know because I won't know. We'll know. So now on to uh, case three. So this is a 28 year old female who was referred to as having been diagnosed with a hemolytic anemia in childhood. And she also had a strong family history of hemolysis um, affecting not only her mother, but also her grandmother and uh, two maternal uncles, one of whom had undergone um, a splenectomy in his 20s. She had a borderline no haemoglobin, a slight macrocytosis with a reticulocytosis. So this patient is actually heterozygous for haemoglobin Köln, which is an unstable beta globin chain variant. And the HPLC shows <coughs> denatured haemoglobin Köln, which is the peak on the far right. Um, and the large peak is haemoglobin A plus unaltered haemoglobin curl. Um, and this diagnosis was actually confirmed by DNA analysis. The concentration of um, the haemoglobin A2 um, may be increased as a consequence of selective denaturation and removal of the unstable variant. Now, haemoglobin curl was initially identified in the early 1960s and appears to be the most common of the unstable haemoglobin variants. Now, the severity of anemia can range from mild to severe uh, and patients often have splenomegaly. In terms of the blood film features, they include polychromasia, irregularly contracted cells, <coughs> basophilic stippling, um, and keratocytes are often thrombocytopenia as a result of hypersplenism. Importantly, um, in a young female, the partner uh, should be tested um, if they're considering starting a family. Now, with some unstable haemoglobins, electrophoresis and um, HPLC can actually give normal results. And so DNA analysis or mass spectrometry, uh, mass spectrometry is required to demonstrate um, a variant haemoglobin. Heat tests, uh, heat instability uh, tests and um, isopropanol tests for haemoglobin uh, tend to be positive. So a precipitate will form um, if an unstable haemoglobin is present. 
Screening for Heinz bodies with um, supravital staining uh, will also be positive um, with denatured haemoglobin precipitating within the red blood cells. So now on to case four. So this was a female pregnant who's eight weeks pregnant. She's mildly anemic with a haemoglobin of 114 um, with thalassemic indices with a raised red cell count low MCV and MCH. So this is cellulose acetate electrophoresis at an alkaline pH on the left. And you can see there is a band that moves uh, with S and a smaller band that runs with haemoglobin C. However, on HPLC, there is a small um, haemoglobin A peak measuring 4.6%, uh, uh, a haemoglobin A2 of 2.5% and a large peak in the D window measuring 93.2%. Now going back to uh, her cellulose uh, acetate electrophoresis, we know that D variants move with haemoglobin S, which makes sense and identifies this variant as haemoglobin D. We know that on HPLC, D Iran has the same retention time as haemoglobin A2, so that excludes haemoglobin Duran, and this variant is actually haemoglobin D Punjab. Now, in antenatal screening, it's important to distinguish uh, compound heterozygosity from D Punjab homozygosity, which can be made difficult by the apparently normal A2 in some individuals. And reported normal levels are thought to result from an underestimation of A2 by HPLC in the presence of D Punjab. Now, in homozygous D Punjab, individuals may also have thalassemic indices. So the differential is compound heterozygosity for D Punjab and beta zero thalassemia, and molecular analysis is required to differentiate between the two. In this case, uh, the diagnosis is compound heterozygosity for D Punjab and beta zero thalassemia, which tends to produce a mild thalassemic condition, often resembling um, beta thalassemia trait rather than thalassemia intermedia, typically featuring mild anemia and sometimes splenomegaly. In this case, bearing in mind that the patient is pregnant, it is important that the partner is screened to determine the risk to the fetus of developing beta thalassemia major or a sickling disorder such as sickle beta zero or sickle uh, D Punjab. So case five. So this is um, a haemoglobinopathy screen performed in a patient antenatally who has um, an entirely normal full blood count. So her cellulose acetate electrophoresis at uh, alkaline pH reveals a band that moves with A and a band that migrates with haemoglobin S. So the HPLC shows that almost half the haemoglobin is haemoglobin E and almost half is in the A2 window. Again, we know that haemoglobin D moves with A on cellulose acetate electrophoresis and that D Iran has the same retention time as A2 on HPLC. So this is heterozygosity for haemoglobin D Iran, which has no clinical consequences and does not interact with other haemoglobins to give a clinically significant disorder. So K6 is a 61 year old female who is originally from Spain, who has a normal haemoglobin, um, but a raised red cell count, low MCH, low MCV. So again, thalassemic indices. There is haemoglobin A and a faint band that mobilizes with haemoglobin S on cellulose acetate electrophoresis. And on HPLC, there is haemoglobin A and a peak in the A2 window measuring 8.3%. So this is actually haemoglobin Lepore. So haemoglobin Lepore has the same ability as haemoglobin S um, at an alkaline pH and has the same retention time as A2 on HPLC. So this patient is a carrier for haemoglobin Lepore. Now on capillary electrophoresis, which I don't have an example of here, 
hemoglobin lipore does actually separate um, from A2, appearing in the same zone as D Punjab and G Philadelphia, with the hemoglobin A2 typically being reduced. Hemoglobin F is sometimes mildly increased, which may be because of linkage to a um, polymorphism that determines the hemoglobin F uh, percentage. Now, hemoglobin Lepore is composed of two normal alpha chains and two uh, delta beta fusion globin chains. In heterozygotes, the uh, full blood count is suggestive of thalassemia trait. And haemoglobin Lepore occurs with fairly low frequency in a variety of ethnic groups, including those of Italian, Greek, Spanish and Turkish, uh, Turkish ethnicity. Now, from a functional point of view, it can be regarded as delta, delta beta plus thalassemia. And it's clinically important because of the interaction with haemoglobin S producing a sickling disorder and uh, beta thalassemia where um, compound heterozygotes have clinical and hematological features of thalassemia major or intermedia. So case seven is a 33 year old male who's originally from Malaysia. He presents with a mild anemia, but uh, a raised red cell count, markedly reduced MCV, MCH and a raised RDW. His HPLC shows a raised haemoglobin F of 15.8%, an A of 21.7, uh, and a large peak in the A2 window of 59.1%, consistent with a variant. Now, on capillary electrophoresis, the haemoglobin F again is raised at 18.4%, um, and there is a variant in the E zone measuring 52.8%. Uh, and again, there is a raised A2, although this is lower than is demonstrated on HPLC, of 6%. So you can see that capillary electrophoresis is helpful in this instance because it permits A2 to be distinguished from haemoglobin E. Diagnosis here is actually compound heterozygosity for haemoglobin E and beta plus thalassemia, because if this was E beta zero, then there would be no haemoglobin A. Now, this is a common finding in Southeast Asia, and the severity is very variable, ranging from thalassemia minor to intermediate to major. Um, and the variation in severity is not always clearly um, uh, explicable, uh, although it is in part related to the presence of haemoglobin A and its quantity, as well as the haemoglobin F level. So case eight, is um, a seven-year-old female of African origin who has a mild hypochromia and microcytosis. And um, the HPLC demonstrates a haemoglobin A2 of 2.2% uh, with variants in the D and S windows and a variant uh, measuring 13.3%. Uh, so there appears to be four major fractions on capillary electrophoresis, there are also variants in the D and S zones and a variant in the C zone. So the diagnosis here is heterozygosity for both haemoglobin S and haemoglobin G <coughs> Philadelphia. Now, haemoglobin S is obviously a beta chain variant and haemoglobin G Philadelphia is an alpha chain variant. And on HPLC, it's represented by four main fractions and shows from uh, left to right. So a small amount of haemoglobin F, then you have your um, post translation modified A, including your uh, glycated A. Uh, then you have your haemoglobin A, which is the largest peak, your A2, and then the three variants on the right, which are haemoglobin S, haemoglobin G Philadelphia, and a haemoglobin S G Philadelphia hybrid. Now, in the majority of cases with G Philadelphia heterozygosity, the mutation occurs on a chromosome with the alpha 3.7 deletion. And so it may be associated with a hypochromic microcytic picture. And in this ethnic group, there is also a high prevalence of unlinked alpha thalassemia. Uh, and so in this case, the microcytosis may be more marked, but the patient will be um, asymptomatic as it's not clinically significant. So lastly, case nine. So this is a 
36 year old female of Indian origin who is nine weeks pregnant. She has a microcytic hypochromic anemia. Her A2 is raised at 5.9% on HPLC, consistent with beta thalassemia trait. But if you look four years um, prior to this, a hemoglobin A2 measured within the normal range, sort of the upper limit of the normal range of 2.9%, um, with a more marked microcytic hypochromic anemia. So why is this? Well, this is a case of iron deficiency, lowering the haemoglobin A2 into the normal range. And so at that time, the diagnosis was actually missed. So it's an important point to remember that iron deficiency lowers the haemoglobin A2 and can mask uh, beta thalassemia trait. But fortunately, this was diagnosed during her pregnancy. So that's my last case. Thank you all for listening. Any questions at all? Thank you, Julia. That's uh, really good of you. Um, I was just going to ask, uh, do we know why um, HBD Iran uh, results in no uh, clinically significant symptoms? I'm not sure, actually. I just know it doesn't interact with the other haemoglobin. So obviously with the other D variants, we worry about the interaction with particularly sickle haemoglobin S and um, beta thalassemia but yeah I don't know specifically why haemoglobin um, DRN doesn't someone else might know though. Uh, Mercy has her hand up. Yes thank you Julia for the uh, uh, brilliant presentation and also for mentioning the fact that um, iron deficiency can uh, sort of underestimate the hemoglobin yes. issue. Um, do you would you be able to tell us what the effect of other hematinics might have on A2, like um, vitamin B12 and uh, the folate as well. Uh, Julia, you're on mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, no, I don't, I don't actually know, to be honest, but again, someone else may know. I only know of the association with iron deficiency, uh, uh, Mercy. Uh, knowing the A2, I, I, I haven't come across uh, any knowledge of it, so, uh, the effect of B12 and folate. Yeah, I think I've read it somewhere precisely, but I cannot. But they definitely, they also affect the A2 as well. I think B12 and folate increased A2. Sorry, is it low folate, is it? When your B12 and folate deficiency increases your A2. Yeah, I think there's something, I've read something like that, yeah. So they actually do the opposite to iron deficiency. Yes. Thank yeah. you, Stephen. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um. Sorry, I had I had a question. This I mean I. This is sort of coming from the pediatric side, um, sort of end of things. And thank you very much for your presentation. Both uh, both the presentations are really helpful. Um. When we see patients in clinic, often who are not you know, necessarily they're sort of in their teens and um, sometimes come across patient of parents who said that they their partner was not screened during pregnancy, um, even though they were antenatally registered in, you know, in, in a UK hospital. Um, I mean, I thought that antenatal screening is universal for hemoglobinopathy. Uh, hemoglobinopathies, is that correct or am I wrong? I think it depends if you're living in a diverse area. Yeah, certainly so in, London, in, a, yeah, yeah. in London it is, but uh, I think it's selective if you're in a, a other areas, but certainly in London it is yeah. because we have such a diverse population. 
but if if there was a person who was you know of um a sort of black or asian origin they they're not screened no matter where they are no they would be, they would it would, I think they, they would, would be based the family on the family origin, origin questionnaire they, they do the yeah. family of origin questionnaire yeah and yeah. Uh, based on that so it's selective based yeah. on those things whereas here in london everybody gets uh, screened yeah so it, it i mean there could be many a uh, sort of slip then in that case if they if the if the families are reporting that they were not screened that means there could have been many points at which those those uh, interventions were missed either the questionnaire wasn't filled out properly or they didn't mm. understand the questionnaire or yeah. you know True. Yeah, that's very things. true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we had a. I think I, I actually in the BSc teaching I presented a case where uh, someone at their local hospital, and I think they lived in an area where you know it wasn't particularly ethnically diverse, mm. and uh, just uh, of Southeast Asian origin, and just missed the fact that they were, you know, at risk of having an alpha naught trait. Yeah, uh, and the implications of that, and then unfortunately the woman had a, uh, you know, delivered a baby with hydrox. And do you, I mean in the sort of adult world, is there just like you know the universal screening of newborns um, went through a, quite a process? Is there any movement towards universal screening of um, pregnant women or people who can be pregnant? Um, I think again, I think it just depends where you live. No, no. Um, what I mean is, yeah. is there any is there any discussion about trying to have a national? Oh, well, just universe. Yeah, not that I'm aware of. Perhaps something for the NHP to advocate for. Agreed. I can pass that along, Lena. Um, does anyone have any other questions for Julia or Amanda? Um, hi, Asad here. Just um, a question. Um, well, for both of you, really. I mean, um, I think obviously in um, specialised hospitals we have access to some of these um, modalities of diagnosis, but in smaller hospitals, in the local um, hospitals. What advice would you give on on um, clinicians and laboratory staff working in those hospitals um, in approaching the diagnosis of these these conditions? Um, if they're following the antenatal guidelines, there's strict guidelines on what they should be sending off, what they should be referring for DNA analysis. And we have quite strict reporting formats. The antenatal one, so we don't miss anybody, and that includes people like with egg donors as well, and sperm donors, and bone marrow transplants and adoption. So there are quite good guidelines for us for the laboratory side for reporting laboratory hemoglobin offices, especially for the antenatals. But we tend to apply that to everybody because it makes it a lot easier. Thanks. Amanda, I was going to ask, where can you access those guidelines or would all labs have? A yeah, all labs should have access to them. We pick them up from PHE and they're on the, they're on the websites. And that, there's a laboratory handbook for laboratories and there's because there's, there's a handbook and that for the actual the midwives and counsellors. But the laboratory handbook has got a lot of information in it and it does tell you what you should be sending away, especially in the antenatals for, for, for further testing on what partners you should be getting in. And it goes through all the ethnic, ethnic origins as well. And it also includes the family origin questionnaire that they fill out. Perfect, thank you. Are there any other questions for Amanda and Julia? Uh, if not, um, I'd like to thank uh, both Julia and Amanda for their excellent talks uh, this afternoon. It's really good of you. And um, yes, uh, clapping, I <laughs> emoji. Um, so th thanks again. And um, next week for the 
uh, HCC members. There is a talk on, let me uh, just get up here, um, uh, diet and nutrition in sickle cell uh, from Professor Alan Jackson at the University of Southampton or University Hospital Southampton. So oh, thanks again everyone for attending uh, this afternoon and evening and thank you Amanda and uh, thank you Julia for the presentation. Thank you. Bye, hope Bye. you have a good weekend. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, excellent presentations.